everybody who has joined us today for the next in our series of 42 Courses Speaker Series. We're so glad that you've taken the time in your day to join us. For me, it's 11 coffee. Uh, for some of you, it will be later in the evening. And for our guest, Josie, today, chairman of BBDO India, he's not actually in India. He tells me he's in Singapore. So do please put in the chat where you're joining us from, what time of day it is, what the weather's like. We always love to see who's joining us. And we are honoured today to be joined by Josie Paul, chairman of BBDO India, and who is also in our creative thinking course in 42 Courses. Josie, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure Great to, to have you here. with us. And yeah. Josie, for, for people who have joined us who aren't familiar with you, with your, uh, with your work, with your professional experience, maybe just give everybody a little bit of a rundown, uh, a little mini bio about yourself. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, where do I begin, actually? I'm, I'm, I'm sort of as old as the mountains. So <laughs> That's what uh, we like, Josie. <laughs> So I suppose, I mean, uh, I started years ago and it really started with Ogilvy. And then, uh, you know, that's when I threatened as a trainee to jump out of the window uh, in case, because the client wouldn't buy my work and it worked. Uh, the client did buy my work. That was Ogilvy where I started. Uh, I, hi everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I hope this can be a meaningful session. I'll try my best, uh, but your questions will make a big difference. Uh, just to give a background, I've been in the business for a long time. I started at Ogilvy and then, uh, you know, went on to have a really wonderful time in Litas and then left that to start an agency called David in for Ogilvy. It was the first David office in the world and we started in Mumbai and then it went to quite a few cities, countries. And after which I set up BBDO in India. So I set up two agencies uh, and it's been a fabulous journey. Uh, we are most known. So in BBDO, we are most known for our work for Ariel, which is called Share the Load. Uh, but there's a lot more that we've done and maybe some of us know about it and I can talk about it as we go along. But yeah, I, I really started my journey because of a tremor. I uh, I was born during an earthquake, so I have a natural tremor. People think I'm on drugs, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> it's just uh, how I got my first job. Uh, you know, I got my first job because I the creative director from Ogilvy who shook my hands, said, you don't have to be nervous of me uh, because he felt the tremor. And I said, no, it's not nervousness. It is creative vibrance and just because of that stupid statement he gave me the uh, job with no portfolio and he taught me the power of faith and the value of guts because with nothing uh, he made me something so uh, I carry these things with me because they affected my life so I value those beautiful people who helped me uh, yeah, so that's what it is. Uh, four agencies, lots of interesting people, beautiful people, and everyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had strong relationships with clients and my partners. And uh, yeah, that's what it is. I don't know what more to say. It's really about my work that I'd rather talk about. I, I, I love that phrase you use there, Josie, creative vibrance. I mean, that is just superb. And you talk about early on there, people having faith in you. And I can recall from one of the stories you tell, uh, we're moving sort of on to talking about creativity, but you speak about early on somebody giving you the license to fail. Yeah. And the importance so actually, of that I, you know, made. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I must give you a bit of history. I was looking for a man called Kersi Kathrak. And I, I used to, I majored in physics at uh, a very well-known Jesuit college called St. Xavier's College. It's like in the top three colleges of India. And, uh, but I made the mistake during my physics uh, studies to go to an art gallery. 
But over there, instead of paintings, there were, and sculptures, there were advertising, uh, there was an ad festival, there was an exhibition of advertising. So I'd gone on the wrong day, but it actually ended up being the right day because I saw stuff that I'd never seen before. I was not in any way connected with advertising. I had nobody in the family doing that. And then I began to see the work and I saw one man winning a lot of awards and his writing was absolutely mind blowing. And I said that I'm going to work for this guy someday. So when I finished my graduation, I started looking for Kersi, but I couldn't find him. Some of the people told me that he had gone to the mountains. So I even went to the Himalayas uh, trekking, to, hoping that I could find him, but I couldn't find him. But through various sort of actions and discussions and connections, I managed to meet the chief of Ogilvy, who gave me the job because of my creative vibrance. So, but I was still looking for Kersi. And then what happened was in, in Ogilvy, uh, I think I got a call from five years later from a voice that sounded like God. And it was Kersi Kathrak. He had returned from the mountains and he was setting up or resetting up Lintas, low Lintas in, in, in India. And he called me and he said, I, I heard you're looking for me. Isn't that amazing that five years later, a man comes saying, hey, this was uh, 1989. In 1989, I got a call from Kersi saying, hello, is that Josie Paul? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I heard you've been looking for me. And then he just made me the creative director. I mean, with, again, you know, this thing about faith, when I don't think I deserved it, I was not worthy of it. But he thought of me uh, more than I thought of myself. And he said, Josie, I know I've given you a triple jump in terms of who you are and what your designation is. Uh, so I can't give you a lot of money, but I can give you something that money can't buy. And, I, and he said, I give you the freedom to fail. And I'd never heard that freedom to fail. Where did that come from? I, my parents are beautiful people, but they never told me that. My teachers never said that. My friends never said that. My colleagues never said that. And then here was this man that I was looking for all my life virtually. And then, you know, he gives me. And that for me uh, changed my life. It changed my creative it gave me creative freedom and it allowed me to do things I would never have done before because now I had nothing left to lose. No, that's, that's an, that's an amazing story and very inspiring in terms of ways in which we can mentor people. So I hope, uh, I hope a lot of people will take that away from them. And I liked that you mentioned that your first exposure to advertising was going to this gallery because that again makes me think of uh, another phrase you used um you talk about trying to collide with different worlds and that certainly was bringing yourself into a new place and exposing yourself then we just can't know when we're talking about creativity we just can't know when we're going to collide with something to inspire us would you like to maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's such a beautiful, uh, you know, question and, and the things you say, especially the word collision. I think uh, accidents uh, allow us to sort of uh, relook at, at ourselves. And uh, I, I tend to, I, I, I want to surrender as a human being to, to the possibilities. Uh, when we work too logically, we end up in the same place. So sometimes I just hope there are accidents. I just hope, you know, that I meet somebody who's not like me or I hear something that's not what I expected. And and this whole joy of serendipity, this whole whole joy of throwing two unconnected things and then finding the connection is something that I've always sought. I I majored in physics and I believe in Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty. And I find in that a certain beauty because when you are put in an uncertain situation, you always find something new versus when you're putting, put yourself in a certain situation, in a very certain situation where you feel you're in control, 
that's all you are you're in control and nothing else happens control doesn't give you anything new there's no discovery so i i seek the lack of control so that i can find something new collision is a way of doing that which is you just take two unconnected things or two unconnected people or two unconnected events or or throw yourself at something new that is feeling not right and something beautiful happens always that's and such that's, a lovely uh, example actually uh Josie because you're you know we're we're talking about creativity and so we naturally think of the arts but you're bringing the sciences in there you're bringing in physics and so the whole concept of you know thinking as wide as we can yeah so yeah, yeah so yeah exactly so which is why uh, when i look at my own uh, creative sort of experiences it was different when i was in ogilvy and very different when i was in lolintas and superbly different when i set up david and completely different when i set up bbdo they all four re- are actually four different lifetimes for me because i was not this guy before and i was not the guy before that so it's it's a form of rebirth uh, it's like i feel like i was reborn three four times <laughs> that's a very indian analogy if you don't mind me saying josie um so when we're talking about creativity another thing that you said is extremely important is to be empathetic and again you you're you're great i don't know if you realize that you do this so much but you're great at sort of put, pulling out these super quotes and in the course you use a beautiful kahil gibran quote you say I, I don't know if you actually worded it like this, but the quote is, may there be such oneness between us that when one weeps, the other tastes salt. I mean, that is just so beautiful. And uh, as you say, empathy in terms of in the world of creativity is so important, isn't it? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we spoke about connecting or collision, which is connecting two unconnected things and then something beautiful happens a third thing and that third thing is new and fresh and no one looked at the world that way and you say hey that's beautiful man how did you make that happen that's one way of looking at creativity which is about connections or about new connections but the other thing about creativity in my opinion and it's only my opinion is sensitivity it's about sensitivity in a world where i think not enough people are listening and that's probably because our lives are being curated that media is curating us social media is curating us we are curating ourselves to look good and uh, in in all that curation and manipulation of self uh, we tend to then not allow the real uh, aspects of our lives to be exchanged and listening it allows us that it, so for me empathy is about deep listening and deep listening is about confessions that there you can go to a place where people are willing to confess and when people confess they really give you the universal truth because their confessions are coming from a very deep place and that deep place is where everybody exists you know it's not one person's confession a true confession is everyone's confession and from that universal place beautiful ideas are born because from that empathetic deep confessional space you can create stuff is what i feel and you can create more pure stuff that is meaningful and that's how some of the work we do uh, goes to that depths so for me sensitivity uh, creativity is sensitivity in a world where no one is listening so many times you see these sort of article statements how to be creative is such an enormous enormous task to ask about but already you've given us this this structure the the license to fail the collision with the new and being empathetic are there any other sort of uh uh rules or suggestions that you you put to your team when you're trying to struggle you know with this very very big question of of how to be creative oh uh, yeah that's uh i mean i i don't know if i have immediate answers but i do know that often we are faced with um, 
uh, situations where you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling anger or you're feeling some sort of uh, roadblock. And, 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 and I always say that that is your moment of creative. Like if, if we can stop seeing our lives as work and life and uh, see ourselves as leading a creative life, then every, every issue is an opportunity to be creative. And I just have a lot of stupid examples of that nature, uh, you know, where you can, it's not about just the work that you do. It's also about the life you lead and, and, and how every opportunity offers that. I mean, just a simple, stupid answer. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you how I once sold a radio spot to Benetton, the client in India, is that because the client before that had approved the radio spot, but after she approved it, a new client came in. And you know that the new person, it's just that feeling, you know, they're not going to approve it. You're just afraid that they're not going to approve it. You're like, you know, you're just scared that you're paranoid. So this is what I did when I went to Delhi with the work that I did for the radio spot. I went and created the radio spot at our own expense. Okay. Because it was not yet approved for production. It was only approved in concept by the earlier marketing director. But the new one had not yet seen it, not even seen what it sounds like. I mean, what it, what the script is. But I went and did something so alarming that people may not believe it, uh, which is that I went, she doesn't know who I am. She, uh, and, uh, they, uh, you know, people didn't know that this is this guy. So I went into the room first when she was sitting in the conference room, like a waiter. I, I put flour on my face and looked like a guy who was slightly waiterish and, and, and went and served a tea with a tremor, which was natural to me, and with a stammer that was one of, you know, submission. And, and she was like, okay, thank you, uh, but please leave the room. And so I left the room and she thought I was a waiter. And then a few minutes later, I sort of washed myself, put on a jacket, took a two in one at that time. And I jumped, I jumped into the room with tremendous energy. And I said, Hi, I'm Josie Paul. I'm from Mumbai. I've come with a piece of work for you. I'm sure you'll like it. And I put on the cassette and played it for her. And she's looking at me like as something happened here in this room. Didn't this guy before look familiar? The guy who served tea, and now he's the CEO of a company. And then I played this uh, the CD, I mean the 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 cassette, and she was, yes, this is really good. Okay, okay, let's let's do it, let's do it. She was so off center. I I wanted her to be off center. I'm sorry, I'm saying these things now, and maybe it's not the right thing, and it's politically not the correct thing, but I had to disturb the status quo to create an environment that was conducive to yes, you know? And for me, that is a creative life. That it's, you got to be embarrassed. You got to be rejected. You got to look like an ass, a fool, so that your work wins. It's, and it's for so me, true, crazy. <laughs> it's like the, because uh, I, whenever you, you have this this really tough thing where you have a, a wonderful idea and but it's all in your head uh, you can try and put it in a storyboard and and make it look nice but until it's real it's so hard often for someone else to understand the vision yeah. that you have so I, I think it's so brave that you actually made it um it's uh, and it and I, I I think, I don't know whether you find this with your teams, I would imagine it's getting a little bit easier, a little bit cheaper and quicker to be able to make things in today's world um, with all the tools. So it must be fascinating. But what an amazing story. I, I think that's that's genius. And, and yeah, even the way I said it was really quick, but was even more dramatic than this. But <laughs> let it be. So So it's about... It's about leading a creative life. It then starts moving into your work as well. And, and, and going back to the whole issue of listening. Uh, recently, I did a session at one of the colleges and it was a two-hour session. At the end, I asked for, if there are any questions and one of the girls said, 
so I have a question for you. Uh, do you think it's okay for me to have chicken? So I, I'm saying to myself, we had we did not discuss this. It had nothing to do with advertising. And the beautiful thing was in the class, nobody laughed. I realized this was important. For her, it was an important question. But no one was listening to her. And so she had to ask me. Imagine she had to ask me this personal question because probably no one was listening to her. And she said, I love chicken, but I don't know about the ethics. And I said, the very fact that you're questioning it means you already have the answer. So who am I to give you that answer? But the truth is that she had a question that was nothing to do with advertising. And yet that was important to her. And that tells me that we need greater listening. I'm, I'm going back to the earlier point about creativity. Whether it's collision or whether it's listening or any other form of approach to creativity or just being creative in your life, in the things we do. It's so much more fun. It reduces the tension. It, 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 lets, uh, it fights cholesterol, man. It's, it's oxygen. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not giving enough direction, but I'm just sharing my view. It's perfect. Um, I, I had one other thing. I, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't want to interrupt a bit earlier, but the, the uh, you were talking about you. You had very different experiences in all the different agencies, um, and from, you know, I think we've talked a lot, and I, I, I'm sort of an ex Ogilvy person, so I know that family and that. Yeah. That, that environment very well and and obviously they change slightly all over the world in the different offices is there uh are there some um sort of key outtakes or some some key things that you noticed you know i'd be fascinated to know what you think the difference is philosophically in in that family vibe but in ogilvy between ogilvy and bbdo and and some of the other and you know i think david is Although sort of Ogilvy, I still think that was a very, very different, different thing. Um, would you be able to share perhaps, yeah, what the what the philosophies were, or what you think they might be between uh, between those? Uh, uh, Chris, it's difficult to say yeah? because I mean, like when when we set up um, when we set up Ogil uh, when we set up David, it was very different from Ogilvy because. I'd gone to uh, the Ogilvy board that was Ranjan Kapoor and said, why don't we call the new agency that you want to set up, uh, David? Because uh, Ogilvy uh, may have chosen the wrong end of his name. Uh, David is an ideology. It, it, it is about challenge. And uh, in 2000, India was coming into its own. Uh, also, national players were faced with multinational players coming into the country. So I said, let me stand for the for the Davids and, and the national players and Ogilvy can stand for the multinationals. So allow me to set up that. And, and that's how it happened. So it's uh, the starting point of David was based on challenge. Uh, Ogilvy was, uh, has always been a fabulous um, reservoir of creative talent and uh, good thinking. Uh, and, uh, and and Linda is very different from that in the sense that Linda is in Linda's, uh, there, there was a certain amount of flamboyance. There was a certain amount of bigger than life, uh, th you know, creativity. It was um, it was also led by a gentleman who was um, himself a, one of the biggest theater people in the country, who was highly charismatic and uh, superbly creative. So these were different environments in their own way, all of them. One was challenge, one was a certain balance, Ogilvy, and one was uh, a certain flamboyant and energy like uh, a Salvador Dali, you know? <laughs> so they all were great, yeah. And, and, and BBD, of course, comes with its own incredible legend of being the most creative agency. When we were in Ogilvy and David, David, everyone would talk about BBDO. And when I was asked to set up BBDO, I was really scared. And I said to myself, I don't think I can set up BBDO in India, but I can set up India in BBDO. And so the moment I realized that, I, I realized I have to provide a new way of looking at it. Like, what is India? 
and how can we represent India for BVDO? And that's how we began to do uh, work that we've done so far. And it's incredible work. So yeah, bravo, <laughs> congrats. Um, it's, I, I, always, I can't wait to see the next piece of work that, uh, that, that's going to win all the uh, can lions and, uh, <laughs> and change people's uh, attitudes and minds around the world. So it's incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I think there have been some questions, right? I think I saw a couple. There are, yes. Thanks so much for that, Chris. And Josie, uh, there has been a question from Serena. And Serena, if you've got camera width or would like to join us to put your question to Josie. Hi, Josie. This is Serena. And I was in Lintas briefly, and I recognize Alec, I think, from your, your description. But yeah. I'm a qualitative researcher, and I wanted to get your point of view on how research can help development of breakthrough creative. Because, um, well, as being on the other side of the fence, if you like, uh, I thought I'd like to hear your point of view on that. Thanks yeah, so much, I mean, Serena. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. And for me, uh, research is everything, but I probably do it my own way. Uh, of course, I, 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 I sort of listen to all the stuff that uh, good people like you get from uh, qualitative research, but then I also do my own, uh, which is uh, what I call confessions. I, I, seek, I seek deeper meaning and deeper truth. And I do that with very long interviews that tend to have uh, reach a breaking point. I call it creative therapy. Uh, it's where you create an environment that allows people to slowly sort of uh, remove the facades and feel comfortable getting into their deepest selves. I'll give you an example. We were talking about eBay and eBay came to us asking us for a purpose. And we said, why would eBay need a need purpose. They're, they're, they're a successful uh, brand of uh, e-commerce. and But I said, let me put my cynicism aside and let's bring people together into a room. Don't spend too much time. And we spoke, spoke about why do we buy things? And, and as we spoke, it, it went for half an hour, one hour, one and a half hour. And then suddenly as we were talking, you know, and, and the thing is you as a person, you got to sort of start sharing your own thing. You in, in these creative therapy sessions, you can't be, there can't be a moderator. Everyone's equal. The moderator tends to become a uh, slightly higher in, in terms of the position. So we, we need equality if there's got to be true sharing. And so everyone's, you as a person who's trying to moderate has to be equal. So you've got to send, create your own vulnerability. And in the process, one of the girls did say that uh, I, I buy things because when I was born, my grandmother was disappointed. Uh, she wanted a boy and I was born a girl. And so I buy things because I want to show her that I'm better than any boy. Now, you can't, you, you won't get that in regular research. It's not that we were out to manipulate anybody. It was just one of those sharing sessions. And then that broke people down. Everyone began to cry. And then the next thing you know is that everyone is now telling you stuff that you've never heard in your life, why they buy things. And that that was just one of the most intense sessions. And I said, stop and let's stop. And they said, no, don't stop. We have things to say. Uh, and, and that resulted in an idea which was called Things Don't Judge. That um, eBay has 100 million things that don't judge. The Skipping rope doesn't judge if you're uh, 72 years old or the diya does not judge if you're Hindu, Muslim or Christian or a ring does not judge if you're uh, gay or straight or whatever. So we have 100 million things that don't judge. And we had other such ideas. But what I'm trying to say is that qualitative research is fabulous. There's a lot of good stuff happening. Are there new ways to get uh, deeper? is all I'm saying. And it can be any form of experiment. Sure. I don't That's know. That's really Emma. interesting and very useful and a lovely story. Thank you, Josie. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Serena. Super question. And what an absolutely lovely 
response, Josie. And I, I, I have a market research background and uh, I can remember first learning about behavioral science. I felt it really undermined all of my previous beliefs about uh, market research and the value of it. And I love the way you've used the sort of the concept of uh, just the basic focus group, but then making it so much more, so much deeper than just the conversation. Yeah, because even when we work on Share the Load, it's been seven years each year, you, you're trying to sort of unpeel a new truth or a new hidden sort of vibe that doesn't, has not been, uh, you know, spoken about. And, and and you say, hey, seven years, now how do I find the next thing? And we're working on something right now. And it's amazing how much more is there. And now we, we've got three incredible confessions, which are just like, you don't know now which way to go. Because you think hey, it's all over, but it's not. It's never over. There's so much lying in human beings. And, uh, you know, just your ability to listen to that level allows some some possibility. So that's one aspect of this. I mean, I've also done crazy things, uh, Serena, to, to, in research terms. I once won a pitch because I stood up at the aircraft and I had 30 pieces of work, which I wasn't sure about, and I asked the entire aircraft to vote for the best work. <laughs> and, that, and that was uh, in 2004. And it was, uh, we won the LG pitch because of that research on in the sky. I have to say that's know. an unusual, unusual approach. It's desperation. I know you can't, we can't, <laughs> you can't institutionalize, you can't institutionalize these things. These are just no. mad, mad moments, mad moments. Yeah. yeah, but they work. So, so that's fantastic. Thank you. You, yeah, you've given us some superb examples here today, Josie, and Touching there on uh, the example you were giving about uh, about the group, about the, the group of people revealing these things about themselves. Earlier on, we were talking about the importance of recognizing cultural differences. And of course, yeah. you're coming in your own direction. We all bring our own biases to these things. Would you like to maybe talk about the importance of that in your work? Yeah, I mean, uh, so recently we did we did this campaign called Stand by Tough Moms, right? I mean, it was uh, for a brand called All Out. And it's quite a powerful piece of content that we created and then built on it. And, 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 and these things come from, uh, sometimes it just comes from having felt the world. So you, all of us can be an antenna. You know, sometimes you may not get the, You've got to be able to sense it as well. Uh, and I remember this session we were having in Chicago for for All Out. And, and, and I said that the mothers are being glorified in advertising. You know, there, there's a lot of um, poetry about the beauty of motherhood. And it, it is true. But 90% of the work of a mother is a bit ugly. It's tough. It's crazy. It's not stuff that people speak about. And we say, what, what if we were to talk about that part? You know, what if we were to sort of uh, say, that's also cool. You know, that's what it is. And, and, and that's how I was born the idea of it's good to be tough. And, 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 and in society, we see that when moms are tough, a lot of people gang up on her. She's doing it for the kid, right? But People gang up on her. And we said, come on, we've got to stand for that. It's a cultural, social sort of thing. And, and that's what we did. We created this campaign called Stand by Tough Moms, which is very, very powerful. And every time you see it, you break down because it's so true and yet fabulous. At least I'm saying it about my own work. Sorry about that. But there's another piece of work we did, which was called Touch the Pickle. And that, again, was based on... Uh, uh, giving women a voice to speak about period taboos and question and challenge it. And so we did it uh, with with Whisper and it was called Whisper Touch the Pickle and it was a platform. So it was not because there are a lot of taboos related to menstruation and and we felt that maybe it's time to talk about it in a brand like PNG and a, and, and a product like Whisper 
uh, pick that up. And that was something uh, that sort of created quite a stir, created a following of positive activism, which is, I think, it's not just about the brand. It's like volunteers came forward, ambassadors came forward, hand raisers came forward. It truly became a movement and uh, led to uh, some element of change or awareness. So, yeah, that 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 was uh, very cultural in nature. And that's and a, and it's not yeah, and it's that, not that's that you a great start, example, Josie. Yeah, thank you. And 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 the thing is, it happened because we went to, for a brief and the, it wasn't a brief anymore because I provoked the client into saying, why are you showing blood as blue and not red? I don't understand it. And the, and there were six women in that briefing, a brief session and, and they got very emotional about it. And they began to, they, they left the brief that they had written and, and got into an emotional discussion, which led to them telling me about, do you know what we guys go through? Suddenly, they were not a client. They were they were people who were sharing their own personal experiences, and that's what I call. There's a difference between a brief and a briefing. A brief is transactional. Somebody has already prepared it and is going to hand it over to you. But a briefing is where you break the brief and bring the human humanity out of it, and then you discuss that. And that turned into an intense briefing session. And then when we heard, I didn't know about these taboos. I mean, I have three sisters, but I was ignorant. It was, you know, hidden. And then here I am finding it, you know, late in life. And I go back to them after one week saying, what if we were to do a campaign, which is not a television spot, which is not all the things we've been doing on Whisper, but if we were to create a platform called Touch the Pickle. And, and they... And they bought it because it was their idea and they never realized it was their own idea. I just gave it back to them. That's why I say empathy. I mean, creativity is a return gift of empathy. You know, it, 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 you were never trying to be creative. It's just what happens. And people say, hey, that's so creative. But it wasn't creative. It was just, uh, you know, listening and putting the point across. So, yeah, that's how it happened. It uh, was never my idea. Uh, and and asking questions. I mean, what I really like about that story of that particular campaign, Josie, is there were women in the group, and yet it was a man who asked the difficult question. And I've heard similar stories to this, where obviously diversity is extremely important, but actually it was an example from somebody recently, and it was something to do with India. And they were saying that the group of people culturally representing India there, they didn't know to ask the awkward question. And it was actually somebody from the outside who saw, saw and at, that was the case in your example, that it was somebody from outside the group who, yeah. who asked the awkward question. Yeah. And, and and the thing is, people say, hey, how do you how do you sell such ideas? And I tell them, I don't sell anymore because I've just returned what they've already given me. So they they it's not selling, it's it's they're buying. They're not we're not I'm not selling, it's not me pushing something, it's somebody inviting something because of the way. Uh, the process is like when I threatened to jump out of the window in my first job uh, because of my idea, I was threatening, I was trying to sell, I was pushing the cause by being dramatic or when I did it with, uh, in the case of Benetton. But now I find there's another way where you don't have to push, you just have to feed what is already there. It's been so great speaking with you, Josie, we're coming towards the end of our session. But just before we wrap up here, I'd love to know if there are any other particular, you've spoken about those two particular campaigns. Are there any other particular campaigns that you especially admire or uh, they can be ones you did yourself or, you know, from other agencies? Uh, and for what reason you particularly admire them? There's just too many great campaigns around the world. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic. But in 2016, when I saw... REI, 
do uh, opt outside uh, you know when they shut their all their stores on um, on on black friday and i saw that and i said this is it man if if brands can have that ability to stand by and create strong action uh, where it looks like you could lose for what you believe in then you've really uh, taken the brand connection to a different level and that relationship can be very very precious because in the long run that will result in uh, you know not just sales but other equities that will uh, help the brand in good times and bad so yeah that was that, that, that's that a great example one. another one of sort of standing out standing outside not just not just following the pack and i suppose that's always the difficult thing to do isn't it to try to break from the existing thought but it's us again it's asking questions asking awkward questions and yeah yeah i mean i think when uh, when these guys did i spent it on myself uh which was the brand that did it I'm Har harvey nichols harvey nichols yeah i thought Thanks, that was Chris. such a that was such a killer uh understanding of human behavior right and and to just be so contrarian in a festival uh, celebratory time when everyone's talking about gifting and gifting and other people and everyone else you touch something that is so real and deep about yourself uh, for me uh, that that was another campaign that blew my mind because i like when people are a bit contrarian i like when people come from uh, somewhere else and surprise you uh, it's the collision right that i spoke about it's uh, you know you know it's just it blows your mind it's 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 out of your zone and so that's uh, that's the only way to grow and just a quick question i, I was just intrigued is is, is there uh, any one or anywhere or anything that you that you look at or look to regularly to to try and inspire you to sort of I don't know just inspire you in your thinking and your and your way that you approach life and the way that you approach creativity in your job um yeah that's that's a great <laughs> great question Chris you know what I look at music yeah because I, I for me music is the only truth music and rain the rain and the music is the only truth <laughs> got a lot music. of that in Singapore right <laughs> yeah rain it's pretty <laughs> regular yeah but in i'm from mumbai so i get three and a half months of amazing rain and i sit out in in, in the rain in my terrace and drink rum and rainwater it's like god is my bartender uh, but one of the other things uh, i forgot i got carried away by the rain music music is something that is so true and pure and i find in that uh, a lot of energy Uh, especially music that has lyrics that impact you and then one of the things i do is i look at the comments section and in the comments people confess they i don't think anyone knows why they say those things they say things that they should, would probably even not tell their friends but the music gives them that license to say something that is within them and when i read those comments and listen to the music uh things happen to me so that's one one way i sort of fill my senses if i may say that thanks chris great question and uh, thanks tracy thanks so much <laughs> i don't know if i made sense but yeah between songs it, and the rain it makes um, a lot of sense I, i i noticed that as well i think you're right it's that some things put you in a certain space where you just feel happy to be open i think you have a a knack of doing that yourself with others um yeah there's i meet lots of people in my life and i'm very very lucky to and you know i the, you definitely have a certain aura about you Josie uh, like it's it's a, and a very good one it's amazing it, it feel i could say anything to you and uh, say so, yeah thank you for being you and thank you for sharing your your just yourself so so openly um with so many it's really kind of you and 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 an amazing inspiration um i think so 
Yeah, thanks. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank and you, thank everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you yeah. Josie, for joining us today. It's been a very, very inspiring session. And I feel you've been very uh, revealing yourself. Uh, and so I hope that everybody has enjoyed uh, picking the inner inner thoughts and brain of Josie Paul today, chairman of BBDO. And we're absolutely honoured that you spent the time with us and uh, we thank you and thank everybody who joined us for this call and we hope that you will join us again.